Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out. My name is Ken Goldberg. I have had the pleasure to, um, to help organize this series. And uh, I want to thank Lori, who's been fantastic, Shannon, who's up here, and everyone who's involved with the uh, Berkeley Center for New Media for all the uh, work that they do in, in putting this series together. The, I believe we're at 200 and... 100, no, sorry, 180-something uh, speakers. So, um, so tonight we'll hopefully we'll add to a long tradition. And our theme, as I mentioned earlier, what is this year is the topic of robo-exoticism. And the, the concept there is analogous to exoticism more broadly, that this idea of, of, of basically trying to impose some kind of, of control over some other that is uh, unknown and unfamiliar by, by basically projecting positive, overly positive fantasies and overly negative fears onto that population. And has a very long history, very, very uh, powerfully captured in Edward Said's uh, book on Orientalism. And and it certainly has, has implications to many different human populations around the world. I think it's also interesting for us to be exploring how that, that may come into play in the concept of how we are thinking about robots in our contemporary culture. And two examples come to mind from just the past week. One is the, if, uh, the, in the Democratic debates, Andrew Yang and some of the other candidates were asked about the uh, specter of uh, robots stealing jobs. And if you remember the whole discussion about automation, Andrew Yang in particular is completely uh, confident that we will have massive unemployment. Everybody's going to be thrown out of work because of, a, of, of this, uh, this impending uh, robotic revolution and that we will need to, to start thinking now about the right form of, of universal basic income or other, other social safety net. I will personally say that I think he's completely off the mark. And um, uh, fortunately, I'm not alone. I'm not an economist, but Paul Krugman wrote a brilliant op-ed basically saying the same thing, that it's a distraction. He said, don't go down the robot rabbit hole. <laughs> and I urge you to read his, um, his rebuttal. But uh, from the technological point of view, I, I think it's really important to push back because robots are very far from being able to take over many or almost any of the jobs that humans do today. So we can talk more about this because it's a whole other topic, but I feel very strongly about that. Anything that involves manual labor, anything involving driving, I think is very safe. We're not gonna have that robots doing those for a very long time. So that's the one on the sort of fantasies, the fears. And then on the fantasy side, many of you watch the release from the company OpenAI, based here in San Francisco and founded by Elon Musk, they released a video of a, a robot hand uh, manipulating a Rubik's Cube. And as they said, had solved the Rubik's Cube. And this was picked up by several, uh, several people in the press. And basically, the conclusion was that we're now on the verge of being able to do all kinds of dexterous manipulation with the robots. And unfortunately, that's not the case either. It's a complete fantasy because uh, when you drill down and understand the details of what they did, it was far less spectacular. It was an interesting result. Again, we won't go into the details right now, but suffice to say that it was an illusion to some degree, and that robot in practice drops the Rubik's Cube eight times out of 10. So the fears and the fantasies of robotics are surround us. And I think they're fascinating to wrestle with and to try to, to, to understand and to be able to put them into context. That's our theme for this year. And tonight's speaker is an excellent representation of this because he's gonna take a position that I think is very interesting, very provocative in terms of, uh, in terms of the role of robot as artist. And he's gonna argue this in a, in a very persuasive way. And he's he deliberately, as he told me, he's gonna keep his presentation somewhat short so that he can maximize the time to argue with the audience. So let's not disappoint him. Uh, so Lionel Mora, Mora is, a, is an artist, a provocateur, a curator, a writer, and an editor. He has a long history in, in the arts. He, he had 
was a uh, was involved with with sculpture and painting in a variety of media, photography in in Europe. He's he comes from from Portugal, from Lisbon, and he exhibited in Paris, New York, Milan, Madrid, Los Angeles in his earlier incarnation. But then around the year 2000, he underwent a transformation and became very interested in robots and the potential for robots to paint or create images and and have and do performances. So then his CV shows a shift when he started exhibiting and these new kinds of machines in art galleries around, the, around Europe and around the world. So he has shown in, in almost every major city in Europe, uh, Bologna, Rotterdam, and all, as well as New York, in, in Brazil, in Germany, Prague, Istanbul, and, uh, and, 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 and many other venues. And he, in particular, the, there was a venue in Paris at the Grand Palais major exhibit known as Art, Artists and Robots that was in um, 2018 last year. It was extremely uh, well curated and had and, and very well publicized in Europe. And he, he was featured, his work, one of his painting machines was featured in that, in that show. And I've known his work for, for almost a decade now, but it was really interesting to see that latest work was very uh, powerful in its, in, in its, in its aesthetics and its, uh, in its nuances. He'll hopefully he'll be talking about that tonight, as well as his more recent robot systems, his, um, his, his various manifestations, and as well, and I hope we'll get him to talk about a play that he put on, a, a, a reconsideration, a reformulation of the classic Carol Chapek RUR, Rossum's Universal Robots, which, as we mentioned, is, gave us the word robot 100 years ago this year. So please welcome Lionel Mora. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, special, uh, I want to start thanking uh, Ken Goldberg for this invitation and the other people that uh, have made this possible. And special, invite, uh, I want to thank Ken because he knows that I, what I think is exactly the opposite that what he thinks. So uh, it's it's very it's very uh, uh, I'm touched by that because. Uh, it's important to have different opinions, especially in a moment that, in fact, no one knows what is going on and what will happen with the robots and with art and with everything. Let's see if this works. No. Doesn't work. No. I need to do it here, probably. So. Uh, I'm an artist, and uh, uh, I will speak about robots, of course, and about uh, machines and uh, the possibility of machines to make art. But let's start with with the human aspect of the thing. Why why do we make art? Why we want to to be uh, artists? <coughs> and it's. Uh, there are many, many aspects, many possibilities. <coughs> and uh, if you search the internet, you see most of the times one of these things. Um, and uh, to be creative, to express emotions, this is very important for humans, to have emotions and express emotions, to impress the others, to do something different, to make money. That's important because art Art is an important industry for decoration and, and, and for design, for mode, for, for yes, therapy, there is also. But there is another possibility that is the one that I'm interested in. Um, we, we, some artists, not many, but some artists uh, want to do art to change the world. Not to be make nice things, not to 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 show some emotions or not to that, but to change the world. And of course, to that to change the world of art, which is almost the same thing, is the same thing in fact. Because when you change the world of art, you are also changing the world and the perception that people have about the world, about 
uh, not only about art, but about the world. <coughs> it's important to understand that when we talk about art, there are many uh, discussions, many debates. It's, it's an almost stopping debate. But in fact, art is an history. There is an history, uh, very long history. And this history is shaping uh, what we consider in each moment of this history, what we consider art and uh, what is art and what is not art. For me, that's enough. Because it's enough as, as a definition of art. Because uh, there are, of course, as you know, philosophical aspects and uh, never-ending discussions about what it is, what it is not. But in fact, there is something that's, that, that is factual, that we know. that. Uh, is the history of art, and you go to a museum and you see the history of art, and it's there, and that is art. Special today, what is in a museum is art. There are two very important moments for me, for my work. Uh, of course, the whole history of art. But there are two very important moments. That's the art of my time, in my time. Um, and I want to, to clarify what, how I understand it. Abstract art is very important. The invention of abstract art was very important because uh, it liberates art from the necessity of representing something. To, so uh, most people uh, understand abstraction or the invention of abstraction as uh, the possibility to make art with alternately f figure, any figurative aspects. Which is problematic because a square is also a figure. So it's problematic. But OK, most people consider abstract art is the one that there are no figures. Um, or nothing that we recognize as a representation. But in fact, what abstract art did was much more important than that. It was the, the, the possibility that art represent itself, not the exterior, nothing, not even feelings or nothing, but it represents itself. And, and it opened the door to our understanding of art, even today even if most people don't, don't say it or don't think like this. But the fact is, uh, a work of art of today represents only itself. It doesn't represent nothing else. Even if people say that they make uh, big uh, narratives around, but the fact is that it is that object is, uh, it ends in the object. A painting is just that. It's just a square or a rectangle of some, with something, some image, something inside. It's nothing else. Um, and this is this is really this was really a revolution in art that opened the door to all the art of the 20th century that after we we, we, we saw until today. The second moment was already a consequence of the abstract uh, abstraction. The the invention of uh, abstract art was Duchamp, of course. When he added to this, so the, the theme of art was art. And we see it all over the 20th century that is very clear for most of the important artists and movements, what they come each time it's to say, art now is this, art now is that. They, they publish manifestos, they explain art now is Something surrealists say that uh, uh, every, every, uh, all all the movements that we, that we we saw along the the 20th century they come and say what it was art because they open a new a new field a new field of art it was something new that that also was art um, and Dusha of course is very important because he said something even more radical say yes. It's true, art is about art, and it doesn't even need to be done by an artist. The, the artist don't need to make the object of art, the object that is about art, but it, it doesn't need to be made by the artist itself. He can just buy something in a shop in a, 
and put it on a museum and, uh, and it's art. You can um, change it a little bit or even not. There are many, many. Uh, of course, Duchamp Urinol is known because he, he put it upside down and then people tell a lot of stories about what it was, what it was, what it means. But in fact, it's just a urinal, it's nothing. Um, but, but of course, with this uh, attitude, he opens the art of today. That means uh, it's art uh, that needs a context to be art. Otherwise, it's not art. A pile of garbage in the street is a pile of garbage. Here inside the, this room in the museum is art. So, and this is the same pile of garbage. It's no, no change. But if we put it here inside, it's a fantastic work of art. So we live in this, in this type of context. We don't, artists don't even need to manufacture the thing. This was a big, big important revolution that most of people also don't, don't accept it. In this line of, uh, of changes, I'm very ambitious, as you can understand. So I want to add something to this history. Um, what I say now is, why, why don't we also think that art can be something done by a non-human? Why it's necessary? Why do we need a human to make art? Why can we not let, or why can we not accept uh, animals as artists? Why not? They are fantastic artists. Uh, but in my case, I even say machines. Why, why machines cannot make art? Why not? Why do I need to, to be doing myself a painting if a machine can do it much better? And can do not my painting, but it's painting, that's uh, a different thing. Uh, I explain how this is possible. Wh what I'm, I'm showing here, most of you, of course, know this very well, but it can happen that someone don't know this mechanism. So I'm sorry for those who know this even probably much better. Uh, what, it, um, what it means, oh, okay. This mechanism. This is an ant, of course, and as you know, ants um, have, have, have a special way of um, communicating with each other. They, they, when they walk and they and they have something to say because normally they walk randomly and just around. But if, for example, that's the, the example that I didn't put it here because it's not necessary, but for example, if an ant finds food and, and takes the food to, to the nest, uh, leaves a trail of uh, pheromone. It's a chemical, pheromone. Um, this, this trail is uh, attractive to other ants. And so when some other ant goes around, and sees this trail, tends to reinforce it. So after a while, we have the famous trails of ants. It's how they are made. This is a very important thing, example for me because it shows how some form can emerge without no one uh, programming it or, 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 or uh, 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 without without uh, an architect, without an artist. So these this, uh, trails of ants uh, are built without no, none of these ants is saying, let's make a trail here. Of course, we humans tend to, to see things in a very awkward way. And we talk about the queen, the soldiers, the workers. Of course, they don't exist in the in the in the end. Uh, they don't have any queen, any soldiers. 
Of course, they have one end that puts x, and that we call queen, but uh, just put x. And of course, and then we have other ants that go to look for food, and some who take care of, air, of the eggs. But then they, they change, they interchange. For example, if the queen dies, they make another queen. So it's not. Um, in fact, if if there is something to say about the um, about ants, they are feminists, radical feminists, because they are all female. And anarchists, because they have no, no one is in charge, so it's really a very strange society. But it works very fine. Um, I was very much inspired by, by ants. Here, for example, is a, very, a simulation that shows uh, the ear's foot. And so when, when one randomly touches this, it makes a trail of pheromone to hear what it, it would be the nest, let's say. So it's curious how this formed, and then they evaporate, the pheromone evaporates. So it's very nice how, how, how this form, how this painting comes up. <coughs> so in 2001, I, I, what is that? I, um, as an artist, when I saw this for the first time, this algorithm of ants working in the computer, I, I saw these trails as, as a drawing, because I'm an artist, so I saw this is a drawing. So why not use this, this uh, self-organized drawing? How can, I, how, how can I use this self-organized drawing uh, to make art? So I've connected this uh, very simple machine in that time. This was in 2001, so it was not a robot, just a cat cam machine, to a computer where the ants were running. The algorithm of ants was running. And then just put, just put uh, 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 a brush here with some paint. And uh, th this was one of the first drawings that came up. And this, what happened here? As you can see, is uh, like uh, a child. What happened? It's not, doesn't like the drawing. Um, but what is interesting is that no, is is now on the very strange. Okay, I hope so. I hope so. I've cut something. So, but the interesting thing is that this experiment, which, what, which was a, an, a, an artist experiment, made something quite interesting for the people who were at the time working with this kind of algorithms. Because, in fact, there is again, it's this. Ah, okay. In fact, um, this, this drawing was something that came out of the computer. It was not in computer because most of the, the investigation was done in the computer. And this was the first time that, that, that the, in fact, this kind of uh, algorithm or was used outside of the computer. And so it, it, it came out in the, in the, um, we have a problem here, came out in the, in the a magazine from uh, MIT about Artificial life, which is, as you know, kind of artificial intelligence, but uh, uh, bio-inspired. So this was <coughs> was published. Um, so later on, two years after, I believe, I did uh, build some robots that were 2003, that they were uh, really like small ants. They are small ants with uh, some sensors to detect color. And so I've changed the pheromone of the ants for color. So these this, uh, robots, you see, they are attracted by color when they find color, their color, because they have, look, they, they put more color. So they built, they built some, uh, some paintings on their own. When they, when they detect color, they put more color. 
like the ants do with pheromone, they do it here with color. This is a painting, very nice painting, where you can see that the process is not just random. Of course, there is some random in the beginning, but where you see these clusters, it's not random anymore, of course. It's just reinforcement of some parts of the painting. I have many paintings, but I just use this one, uh, where you can see the clustering. That means that the process is not random. But it's also, also not programmed. I didn't program this. I would never do a painting like that. So I didn't program this. I just gave this robot some rules, basic rules, and then they build the, the artwork. I didn't make the artwork. <coughs> this is another, also nice. Then <coughs> here, I think is, ah, this is, uh, this is a robot that is in a museum in New York, in the American Museum of Natural History, that I, I, d I did in 2006. It's not a swarm because he's in a, inside a, a, a place in the museum, he's alone, but he, he, he works basically with the same principle. So he builds a, a drawing uh, by itself, he starts from nothing and then here was an experience in, in the museum before he went in the, inside his, his arena, his cage. And then, he, as you can see, he's building, building a, a painting. Here's something done by this robot, um, where again you see some 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 composition, so this is, this is not just scribbles, this is a composition, it's an abstract painting. Yeah. <coughs> In that time, I gave much, many conferences and went with my robots everywhere, and there, there was something irritating when, I hope today it will not happen because now I'm saying it already, it was something very irritating when there was the, the, the interaction with the people, they always say, yes, but wh when does the painting is finished? Who, who says when the painting is finished? Yeah. And I say, that's not important. But uh, I stop the robots and it's finished. Yes, but then you are the artist. The robots don't, don't, don't decide when to finish, so you are the artist. So this was very irritating because it was not interesting at all. It has nothing to do with the process. but. Okay, so this robot, the uh, HEP, Robotic Action Painter, decides by itself when to finish. He decides when to finish in an intelligent way, not in a, a quantitative, not after three hours or after painting 500 times with the blue, no, nothing like that. It's, 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 um, it's based on the sensors, what it sees. What it sees at a certain, I will not go on this technical aspect, but it's a, a decision of um, a kind of free will. He, he decides, now it's finished. And he signs with his name, Rep. Because I, I was so irritating with this kind of questions that I put the robot also to go to the corner when he finished and he signs the Rep. Myself, I sign also as authentication to say this is done by a robot. It is not for someone, someone that can make it and then say, no, this is authentication, but, uh, but robot science, rep, his name. And it's very curious, for example, here are from several paintings, he always signs his name, his name, in a quite different way. So it's really, it's really not uh, 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 what we could consider a programmed robot, like an industrial robot that always do the same thing. He, he, he never does the exact same thing. He, he always changes a little bit, but tries to make the thing the best. And he, he also, not always, he, he can go to the right place. Sometimes he signs in the middle of the painting. Here is the robots that were in Paris, here in Astana. They are very, this was an adaptation of uh, an existing robot. 
uh, but um, they are a swarm, they, they work together and they make uh, quite uh, nice paintings uh, with the same system. So when they have sensors, when they de detect their color, each one has a different color and then they reinforce the color, that color. <coughs> the paintings are really sometimes very nice, like this one, quite nice. <laughs> but, <coughs> so, what I say as an artist, my, my work, my work, of course I'm an artist, I don't make paintings. I'm an artist that makes robots, that makes paintings. So in 2004, I said, um, making the artists that make the art. So what I'm making is the artists that make the art. I'm not making the art. I'm making the artists. It's a quite different uh, attitude from uh, most uh, artists that want to control their work. I don't want to control. I want to lose control to the robots that they can uh, perform their own um, uh, way of building a painting. So, in fact, in fact, these paintings are self-organized paintings. They they uh, they are paintings that 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 make itself. It's a painting that is making itself. It's not programmed to do this. Or, uh, and even, even the, the same robots in the same conditions, they produce sometimes things very, very different. So it's not, it's not that they make always the same. So for me, this opens the, a door to something that we can call the non-human art. That means some, something that we accept as art, like is the case of my paint, uh, these paintings of my robots, because they are already in museums and things like that, exhibitions and so. So we accept as art, but it's not really done by a human directly, at least. It's not done by a human directly. Also, avoiding some questions that can come up, uh, also, uh, um, people say that, yeah, but you create the robots, so you are the artist. Uh, robots are, they don't care nothing about art, it's true. But, but, but uh, th this, this, for example, I give an example that everybody understands. So you go to school and your teacher teaches how to write. Then later on, you write a book. Who is the author of the book? Your teacher, of course. It's not you, or it's you. So bec why? Because you, 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 you learned how to write, but then you incorporate some things of yourself. You put some things of yourself. It is the same. I've teach these robots how to, to move and to go around and to even to, to paint. And then they make their painting. So, so it's not, uh, uh, it's not a, a, we should not make it really um, so, so linear. It's not linear. It's more complex than that. Here, a great artist, Congo. Congo, uh, this very interesting uh, photo and uh, very interesting work. Desmond Morris, which was a scientist, but also a little bit uh, an artist, an artist. He put some of this chimpanzee Congo making paintings in the 50s already. It's incredible. And so this, uh, and, the, and the chimpanzee enjoy a lot making paintings. So there are a lot of paintings of this, uh, this animal. We are also animals. But OK. Um, and and the, it's, it's, it's being accepted as art because, for example, Congo paintings were uh, a few years ago in a gallery in London as an exhibition of art and, uh, and is sold in uh, auctions and things like that. We have other examples like uh, it's very well known the Mauerberg 
installations that he, he goes to look for colors and makes a kind of composition to attract females and it's very interesting as, as uh, how can we say that this is not art and, uh, and then we say that some someone that makes some lines in a, in a canvas and that is art. What's the difference? This is more interesting. This is termites that make these constructions. Um, exactly because in this case of these uh, types of constructions, there is no plan, no architecture, no plan but uh, they are extraordinary uh, forms, extraordinary uh, works of art that we can easily uh, look at it as a works of art. Mm. And here it's one of my uh, paintings from robots and, uh, and also uh <coughs> it's a, a very similar pr uh, uh, process from the termites. So from nothing, they built this kind of painting. This is one, could be one. My vision, which is very different from Ken, of robots. Uh, I did this in 2007 for a book. And I consider that there is a, a new domain, which is robot. Because I consider robots a new species. It's true that it's a species that is created by us, but that's uh, for the moment they are created by us. But it's true that they are starting to invade the, the planet. This new species, and I put here just the, the autonomous, the humanoid, the, the, the bio, nanorobots, for example. And, and I see the evolution of this this new species, very similar to th this evolution. So when people say, ah, it's no problem, robots will never take over, we never take our jobs, they will never do that. Uh, yes, they will never do that when they are here or here. But when they evolve, they, may, they will for sure do it. Uh, just think about, especially the ones who are a bit older, the first cell phones. Uh, I had a, one of the, the first cell phones. I had one was like five kilos, and we need to, to take it, and to connect to the phone was with a very strange thing. It was very complicated. Today, the cell phone is not, a cell, is not even a phone. Is, is much more, in the beginning it was a phone, just a phone. And then there was message, and, uh, and today the cell phone is not a, a phone. Uh, in, in fact, it's, it's some, some way that we are connected to the internet and uh, through it to, every, to all the other people in the, in the planet. So it's a completely different uh, object. But it starts as a five kilo brick, so. So robots, it's true that robots uh, are still very primitive. Um, they are not uh, very well uh, in what they do. Really, they don't perform very well. But they are evolving for the moment. We are helping robots to evolve. But at a certain moment, they will start evolving by themselves. And, and then it will change really completely. And in the field of art, I, I like to say that I like very much this uh, sentence because I really believe that uh, for the moment my robots do paintings, which is a trivial thing. But in the future, they will do their art, which I don't know what it is, but I'm sure we will love it. I'm sure. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I'm ready for uh, hey, excuse me. Um, getting back to the manifesto, item six.
Can we go back to that slide? Sorry? I have a question there. What? Uh, can we go back to the slide that has the manifesto? Which one? Um, the manifesto. I, I was curious ah, about. the manifesto. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I didn't understand. Sorry. Uh, for number six, if you choose the color, aren't you also influ influencing the art? I, I don't care nothing about color. I just put one up and uh, I, I don't care so much about it. It's, it's not, it's not a dec decisive uh, thing to put red or blue or yellow. Or, it doesn't matter. It, it does affect the contrast or, or the, the color no, combinations. No, no, because each robot Normally, when it's a swarm of robots, mm -hmm. uh, each robot is, is um, stimulated by a certain color. For example, the one who have a, a, a red pen mm -hmm. is stimulated by red. If it sees blue, it doesn't care. You walk away. So it's stimulated by the color that is, it is using. How many colors do you, do you work with? It depends. If the, it's a swarm and I have 10 robots, I can put 10 colors. Okay. <coughs> the, the robot that's in New York is, has six colors. Uh, it's one robot with six colors. Normally, I have robots with one, with two, with three. It depends. <laughs> but it doesn't change the color. The color is the pheromone. It's what stimulates the machine. But it doesn't change the, the process if it's one color or another. So it doesn't influence the process. After, in the end, we may like more the blue or <laughs> we like more. But that's, that's uh, it's not, uh, the process isn't, doesn't have a, doesn't can, can I Can I follow up on that, Lionel? Because, um, so just to take that, you're, you're saying that the color doesn't matter. It, uh, you don't you don't care me, yeah. me, my, me i don't care you don't care um and the the forms the lines the arrangement that doesn't matter either presumably it depends on the robots for example uh, uh rap the robot that's in new york um he decides also the kind of line that he wants to do but you say he decides so you 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 don't you say you're indifferent you don't care is yeah, that I right? don't care, no. you don't care so i guess my then then i'm curious if the you know the robot is turning out many paintings presumably yeah and if you don't care then they're all equivalent they are, yeah so any painting is as good as any other painting to exactly. you exactly i keep them all you keep them all yeah. and there's no 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 preference of any one over any other for me not but, but as I've sold already several paintings, the collectors come and say, I like this one. Okay. Okay. But to you, that's... <laughs> it's not important for me. It's not important for you. So there's no... I, I, I may also say, I like more this one than the other one. Uh -huh. my taste. Yeah, of course. Because there, I'm, a, I'm also an um, observer. But as an artist, I don't care. As an artist, in the process, I don't care nothing about. It. Well, I, I hear you say that, but I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna express some skepticism about that. Because <laughs> yeah. if you don't care, then then these the these these paintings are actually quite beautiful. But if you didn't care, they don't I don't think they would be. Mm -hmm. So, I've seen paintings that have, you know, a, a fair number of people have done paintings, and they're terrible, much worse. Much, I mean, yeah, sure. they're painful to look at. Um, yeah. But your paintings are not. In fact, even that yeah. blue painting with the drips that you showed us is quite beautiful. Yeah, now, yeah, I, course. I'm going to conjecture that you selected that. No, 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 no. This, you say any random painting, and none of these were choices. This one was selected by the collector. This is, belongs to a collection that selected the painting, not me. But you, you are indifferent. You, none of them I'm would matter to I, you. No, it's not indifferent. I'm not indifferent. But what, what I'm saying is, I don't, when we're in the process of making a painting, I, I'm not, uh, I, I, I don't put one color because I like more. I, I even tell you one thing. I use um, these uh, felt paints. These robots work for hours, especially when they are in exhibitions, like uh, in Paris, they were working three months. 
every day <coughs> for many hours. <coughs> so the felt pens, I use the ones who are called dry safe. They don't dry, otherwise they, they need to be changing all the time. They are mostly made for children because they forget to close the pen. So, uh, these pens, dry safe, they have only four colors. Red, blue, green, and black. What can I do? I don't choose. It's true that some are blue, some are red, some are green, some are black. Because I don't have a, I, I don't have a choice. No, it's one I thing would like to have. You would like to have. Yeah, to have more diversity, but. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to hint at is that I think, and, I, and I'm sorry, if someone else can take the microphone yeah. away from me. I, I could yeah. go on for a while here, but I'm. I think that you're making some choice in the in the process, and therefore I think that you are still the artist. Yeah, okay. But I'm an artist. But I'm an artist. I, I yeah. am an artist. I don't. I just don't make the paintings. But I'm an artist, of course. You must understand what uh, what I, I I've, I've started when I start with this uh, the evolution of art itself. My my goal is not to have a nice painting like this. It's not my goal. My goal is to change art, to 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 add something to the history of art, like other artists have done. And what I'm trying to 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 say is, we are in a time that we should start accepting art made by non-humans. We should start accepting that animals and machines can also make art. This would be even better for us, because we, we, we would have much more diversity. You know that humans uh, are in such a big problems today, um, because it's not only climate change, it's, it's the extinction of animals and so, because we tend to, 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 to look at us as the best, the more clever, the more intelligent, and all the other animals are stupid, they, they are good for, for being killed and nothing else, or being used, and this is very wrong. So, my work is very much connected with um, what I said there, the rise of, 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 of understanding that we are not the, the only ones in the planet. There are plenty of animals, plenty of life forms, other life forms. They are so important, so much important as, uh, as the humans. And humans are destroying everything. So, this is also a statement of that kind. M my work as an artist, I say, we should start looking at all the other life forms, which are also able to produce something that we call art. And machines also can do it, and we can call art to that. And in fact, this is art because this is from a, a, a very important collection, and they have very good art. Picasso's and so so like that. So uh, and this is made by robots. So <coughs> we start already accepting it. Of course, probably this collector still look at me as the artist. It's possible. But we are open already, op start to be open to, to, to this new possibility of having uh, non-human, like, like we have start, uh, we start being uh, open, because uh, 50 years ago, people would say that animals are not intelligent. Intelligence, we are intelligent, the only ones. All the others are completely stupid. And today, you don't say that anymore. For example, the intelligence of ants are very useful, and we understand that they are really intelligent in a different kind of intelligence. Um, can Can I ask my question because it's relating to this? Okay. Okay. Uh, my uh, this last bit, not about the collector, but about th thinking about animals, um, just follows on what I wanted to ask. Um, which has to do with the analogy that you're making um, between machine art or robot art and mm -hmm. the ants, and, and there, there being a kind of interspecies connection. Yeah. And even now in your response to Ken, you've invoked the need to think environmentally about the future of art. 
next to a series that's also devoted to the role of inclusive intelligence and robots in the future of art. And that connection isn't always made. And so maybe this is just sort of a question for our community as well about what it means that you're using an, uh, an interspecies relationship in order to also galvanize yeah. uh, an inter-machine, a human-machine relationship. Okay. Okay. And just to think together about what that means that you're doing that. Yes, of course. Of course, the, the fact that in the beginning I was lucky because I came across this first algorithm of ants done by Mark Dorigo that you probably know. And so I, 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 uh, my model from that moment was not human anymore, but it was ants. And, and in doing that, that's why in doing that, I've, I've changed completely the the, the perspective of making some object that, that we call art. Because if I uh, keep on using the human model, I would tend to, um, for example, like, like people that are using artificial intelligence to make art. It's ridiculous what they do. Because what they do most of times is they take 500 paintings from the 17th century, which is ridiculous already because we are in the 21st century, why go to take paintings from the past? They take 500 paintings, they give to the, 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 to the program of artificial intelligence and they build a new portrait. It's ridiculous, what's the interest of that? This is nothing. But why? Because it's people, most of times they are not artists, so they know nothing about art, but that that, that are using the human model and they want to do something uh, which is inscribed in the human uh, way of understanding what is art, what is uh, and that. The other aspect that I would say, and you are here many people from robotics, I really don't understand why people insist in making robots with two legs. Why two legs? Why not four? It's much better. It doesn't fall. So they spend millions of money and hours trying to put a robot standing on two legs. Why? So this human model that's constantly there and it's really stupid, I'm sorry to say. Why? Of course, then after can be useful for a few things. And it is. And there are robots for this today. We, sp we talked about these robots from Boston Dynamics that makes robots that are fantastic. For me, they are more like works of art than really robots uh, in, in, in the sense that they are making it. Because they are beautiful. They are beautiful in that sense and uh, interesting. But why, why two legs? Why? I don't understand. So we need to change the, the attitude and not look so much to the human as the center of everything, the most important, the one that we must make a model. Uh, why? Okay. Hi there, I have a question for you. <clears throat> um, we touched a little bit about uh, on the color, and, and so what I wanted to ask about were the shapes. Um, so I'm just wondering if, since we see a lot of circles, and then even in some of the pieces where the brush strokes are shorter there is an arcing to them so i'm just wondering if that's a product of the the is a, the robot itself that's just a limitation of the robot itself or no 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 it depends very much for example you don't see so much circles small lines but in this case this robot uh, creates the line in the moment that it is making it so as you can see there are not two lines similar is making the lines uh, in the moment that he's, ma he's making it. So he's deciding how the line uh, looks like. So what happens with the, with, the, with the round? It's in the first robots. They had uh, two sensors, like two eyes, left and right. And it had two colors. And so what happened is when the, with, uh, he saw, for example, blue with right eye, he paint blue and turn to the right to keep on 
in the blue. You see, so that's why it's making all these rounds. But not this one. This one, for example, doesn't make it. And I have uh, many robots, very different. Some they make just straight lines, some short, long. It doesn't matter. Hello. So Hello. apologies for the slightly long question. I just worry that if I don't give like a, a shortened version of my own thought process, then it won't make any sense. But um, Walter Benjamin in The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction talks about how that art may be reproduced mechanically, uh, takes the sanctity of the original, like it robs it of its aura mm -hmm. and the art is left with its explicit function and what it can do for the world. The fact that robots are reproducible and also artists like you could create another rap what does this do for the function of artists to have like an artist that could be infinitely iterated yeah of course uh, that, that 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 text from uh, benjamin is very important because he was probably one of the first to understand the impact of the reproducibility mechanical technology in that time mechanical uh, in art because he saw that but I, do, I don't I don't see it uh, as of course he talked about the, the loss of the aura of the artwork but for example um, I've uh, recently when last year when I was in Paris with this uh, exhibition uh, for many years, I didn't went to um, to to the museum uh, where is Mona Lisa. I don't know if you ever been in that in that recently. Uh, Louvre with Mona Lisa. It's a room very ugly, and there is Mona Lisa in the end, and there is like two thousand Chinese people mostly, <laughs> and then some Japanese, some French. You you even can't see Mona Lisa. And they are all with cell phones taking photos. So if this is not aura, what is aura? The aura is what? Is the reproduction? When people go there to make a photo, they even don't look to the painting. You cannot even see the painting because the painting there is a glass. With a bar. It's ridiculous. So I don't see the, 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 the text of Walter Benjamin so much as a critic to the revolution of uh, works of art, but as a guy who was incredible uh, and could understand what was coming. He was the first to, to understand what it was coming. Um, and I read it in that sense, not in the sense of uh, this is very bad. No, bad is good, what is bad is bad. But it really, um, yeah, as you know, for example, the other, other, other thing that you know very well is uh, something that you see many times in, uh, in, uh, in media, when you go there, it's always smaller. When you meet someone that you have seen on television many times, it's always shorter. Because the media tends to make it everything bigger. Um, so, uh, in a way, reproduction also adds to a kind of aura. It's a different aura from before, but it's an aura, an aura of repetition. Repetition. So, in the case of this, uh, in this, this work, um, this is a, as an incredible aura. And when you see the robots working, it's incredible because I've. The people are really amazed by that because the robots are, make also a performance. It's a performance. And, and, uh, and when people start understanding, first they don't understand what's going on, and then they start understanding that they are putting color, and then tend to be there looking at it. So it's really a performance, incredible. So, I'll um, okay. Can I chime in over here? Okay. Sorry. I just wanted to say. But the lights don't let me. See. No, that's fine. I just wanted to say, amazing. I love everything that was going on here. I wanted to express how much I appreciate your understanding that the colors don't really matter. We're already limited by what we can see in this visible spectrum of light and colors. And then the motions that they have, or some people might say, oh, but they're circles or lines or straight mm -hmm. lines. But 
that's kind of the limitations of what they can possibly do, just like we are limited to a range of motion with our arms and what we can reconstruct. I just wanted to say it's beautiful. I completely agree with you. Okay, thank you very much. Hello. Oh, hi. Thanks so much for your talk. Um, Sorry. I because I have this slide. I don't right see here. Well. Right in front. Ah, okay. Front and center. There we go. Um, I'm really fascinated by these paintings. I think they're also aesthetically really beautiful. Yeah. But I'm interested in why you feel the need to say it's non-human art, and then also to maintain these human non-human dualisms. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm kind of wondering, thinking about mm -hmm. post-human studies like Donna Haraway, this work of assemblage mm -hmm. right now, mm -hmm. isn't everything always already? like human and non-human? I mean, even within human bodies, our microbiomes exactly. and our stomachs kind of dictate how we feel. Exactly. And so I'm wondering why in the language of this work you mm -hmm. invoke this like genetic evolution, a phylogenetic tree, but also mm -hmm. maintain these dualisms. Yes, now you are right. But I do it for two reasons. One, as, as a statement, as an artist, to, to, to open this door for um, that we accept other kinds of, of, uh, of art uh, done by animals or by robots or whatever. So it's, it's, it's more a, a statement from the side of the art that, that I say that I insist so much that I'm not making the paintings, but because I, I'm trying to open a new field for art exploration, a field that is not done by humans, but by other uh, uh, creators, if you want, uh, robots, uh, animals, etc. <laughs> there is, for example, um, a friend of mine that uh, works with uh, bioart, bio and um, she makes incredible paintings with bacteria. It's very fascinating. So it's very nice. OK. Um, the second reason is exactly the, the more, um, let's say, philosophical. That means that uh, by insisting in, in the, in the non-human, of course, I agree with you, we are human and non-human at the same time, and, but we don't recognize it. We tend to not see it. We don't see it. And uh, so I insist because we need to start seeing it much better because not only to stop the, the, the bad things that we are doing to the planet and to the other life forms, but because it opens our view of, of things and it's, it's, more, it's more rich. It's, 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 uh, um, you see, we have, we have several problems as uh, a species and, and um, we tend to see a lot things like uh, um, uh, uh, I would say zero sum game. So uh, one thing against the other. We we have difficulty to to see one thing more the other. Like for for example, in the beginning, I say, but if if uh, robots start making paintings, what can we do now? What are artists, human artists, going to do? And I will say yes, but uh, no. There are American painters, French painters, Portuguese painters, Spanish painters, robot paintings. It's not less, it's more. So it's, it's, it's not bad for any, anybody. So, um, so we must, I insist in the non-human because we must open our view to the non-human view. We have passed too many centuries looking at us as the center of everything all around was nothing. And that's bad and we see how we are in this moment because of that. Question here. Um, hi, I have a question. Um, as you mentioned in the lecture, the robots can draw different drawings every time. Then what's the difference between all those drawings? Because it looks like they have the same uh, rules. Um, and how you update those different versions of the robots. And if you um, set more rules for the um, mm -hmm. robots, to some ex uh, will it be to some point the robots will be designed or be programmed? 
Yeah. Um, because you put more your thoughts into onto exactly. the robots. Yes. Yeah. Thank uh, you. That's a very good question. W what I'm trying to do over the years is exactly the other way around, is to put less and less of me in the robots. The ones that I'm making now, the new ones, they are much more autonomous. Um, uh, so I want to I want to take myself out as as much as possible. So not decide the kind of line. Perhaps in the future, not decide the color. You may have a lot of colors and decides what kind of color. Uh, so to 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 decide um, to have the less possible decisions from me. Um, in fact, uh, the the robots they are all. Uh, similar in the process. There, there is like simple rules, very simple, each time even simpler, um, that produce complexity. So it's the, the principle is that. So I want to put myself the minimum possible. There is um, wait, wait. No, there is sauce. Okay. okay, but you need the. Yeah. yeah. Should I? <coughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Hi. Thank you for your talk. Um, I have a question regarding agency, because mm -hmm. what I hear a little bit is saying that okay, it's no longer just human making art or um, necessarily you telling the robot to make the art, but more a relationship, a co agent relationship. And um, I used to work for an artist. His name's Thomas Serencino. He's based in Berlin, and he works with spiders. And I'm, I'm a scientist. I come from cognitive science. And I was working in his spider lab. And it was really hard at first for me to see that the spider was making the art, or who's the artist in this equation. And there were so many challenging questions in that uh, role that I had there. And in the end, I was won over. I was really won over by the fact that it's not Thomas making the art, it's not the spider mm -hmm. making the art, it's somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. And it's our egocentric bias that's keeping yeah. us from seeing that we can work collaboratively. Exactly. That it's not about a question of who's making the art, who's gonna get the money. Exactly. And it was, it was really funny because he also had an exhibition in Paris recently and I overheard people there saying like, shouldn't the money from his art go to the spiders? Why is he getting it? Yeah. And it's again this question of, humans have this tendency to think, and it's, it's a natural cognitive tendency. It's really hard to get over this egocentric bias. Yeah. And what I think is brilliant from what you're talking about and also Thomas's work and other people who work interspeciesly, be it robot, spiders, whatever, ants, um, is that it challenges us to think about our species, the human, mm -hmm. and our limitations. Yeah. And I think uh, Nick Bostrom actually wrote a really brilliant article called about transhumanism and he shows the spaces of being from this existential question mm -hmm. of being that humans occupy the smallest we can sense the least in our world mm -hmm. animals bigger mm -hmm. and then transhumanists a little bit more and mm -hmm. post-human et cetera, et cetera. i mean some of it is a little questionable but i like that idea of bringing back in the context of art working interspeciesly, mm -hmm. challenging the way we think and our epistemologies about agency, about mm -hmm. our limitations, about our mm -hmm. narcissistic egos, like mm -hmm. bringing us back to thinking about what does it actually mean to be human? Mm -hmm. What are our limitations and how can we expand it by working collaboratively? Mm -hmm. And it'd be nice to see not about who made the art, but how. So you were also stressing the process. The process. So, um, yeah, thank you for that. And okay, thank you. And, yes? Okay. Hi. I guess now I'm getting a little silly going back to my other question. Uh, so, two part question. One, what's your, what is your favorite color? Uh, I'm, I'm colorblind. See, that's, that's my second question. Uh, well, that's because you mentioned the like you, there there was one set of ink that there were only four colors. You mentioned green and, and red, and I understood those are two of the most common colors yeah. that that people cannot see. Yeah, exactly. So, so so you so at this time you don't have a favorite color or no? Really? No, no, I don't. So I was wondering how I'm, I'm more I'm more um, sensitive to red, of course, like a color blind. Mm -hmm. So I see more red than what it is there, uh, but. Um, but it doesn't even, 
No, I don't know if I use more red normally than. No, I don't. I don't care so much. Okay. What about people who are color? Other people who are color blind. Do Do you get different comments with the art? I don't know. <laughs> I've never. Okay. All right. Thank you. I never come. I think this is a follow up, basically a follow up to the question from our scientist friend. But uh, yeah. I'll start with a potentially, hopefully non controversial statement that because art is basically a human concept, I want to ask what you believe the intention of the creator, what role that really plays. You know, the robot doesn't necessarily know that it's creating art. Mm -hmm. Is it because art is a human concept that it's the problem of that definition? That is why we can't recognize that at art. Uh -huh. And I think the second half of that is, mm -hmm. uh, what does creativity mean in this in exactly. this context? You know, to yeah. me, creativity is the mm -hmm. leaps that are greater than the sum of the rules and past experience. Exactly. Um, I'm not sure where the question is in that second part, but it's, it's, a, it's a thought. Exactly, exactly. No, that's OK. Um, we, we we understand that uh, it, intelligence is, is a mechanism of nature. All, all uh, um, um, beings have in, a kind of intelligence, different. Because that's the, that's the problem that I was talking about. When we talk about intelligence, we tend to see only the human intelligence. But there are many forms of intelligence. Bacteria, for example, are extremely intelligent, so intelligent that they kill us. So it's incredible how this small thing can kill us. Well, and they are even winning the, the war, as you know, uh, because they, are, they, are, they have the in incredible capacity to mutate to avoid the antibiotics, as you know, and it's a big problem. So, so there are many forms of intelligence. Um, I believe that there is also many forms of creativity. Life itself is very creative, as we can see, because there is so many uh, forms and behaviors and so on. So creativity is a mechanism that we can reproduce, simulate. Like we can simulate intelligence, we can simulate creativity. In fact, these robots, they simulate uh, a kind of creativity based on the ant model, but on other models, like, again, bacteria, for example. They also, as you know, the bacteria tend to, to, to go together in clusters. That's why they are dangerous sometimes. Uh, they tend to go together and make clusters out of, a, out of a, ca a chaos in the beginning. There is some order coming up. Um, and, and so these robots, they, what they do is exactly that. So they simulate what I could call a natural creativity, a form of natural creativity. To call it art or not, that's the other issue. You are right that art is a human thing. Uh, but as I've explained in the beginning, the evolution of art uh, makes that today, art is everything that's here in the museum, anything. So, if this painting comes here, it's art. So it's not so much an issue what is art, what is not. Uh, it's more acceptance. It's more. It's more. Has more to do with people uh, agree that this can also be art. Consensus. It's more social or community consensus because. It depends on the on the, on the cultures, on the parts of the world, uh, and and uh, and and even on communities don't accept, for example, that a certain kind of art they don't accept it as art. So yeah, there is. So the, the to say that something is art or is not art doesn't depend how it's produced, but depends on cultural consensus. Nothing else. Today may change today, but OK. Do you mind passing this to him? OK. Um, so I, I have two questions, if that's possible. I was wondering when you said um, that uh, you are 
the artist that's making the robot that's making the art. Do you then consider the robots as a work of art that you're the artist of? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that was the simple one. The second one would be, uh, all of this to me kind of relates to cinema and the, mm -hmm. the theoretical um, arguments about uh, whether it's just a machine filming or if there is the director's intention. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about the future of art and that um, robots should also be, that are they are going to be more and more considered as the artists themselves, where then would you see the future of cinema? Of? Of cinema itself. Like, do you think cinema is going to have its, um, I don't know, is, if it's going to mm -hmm. have uh, an effect on mm. this particular art? Well, of course, I'm... I'm uh visionary oh, and not a skepticist. I'm a visionary in the, in the positive sense of the word. Um, and when I say that, uh, that um, the, the machines will make art like paintings in the future, uh, I believe they will make almost everything that we call today art, like films, uh, theater, plays, if you want, dance, anything, music. Music is happening already. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of people working with uh, machines to make music, um, um, and uh, and uh, that 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 uh, the machine is the machine is producing the music without uh, uh, interference from uh, a human, for example. But music is more easy because ma it's mathematics. Music is mathematics, so it's more easy. Of course, other, other kinds of uh, expression is more difficult. But, um, <coughs> but, but this is, is to be, to, be to, to see in the future. Uh, what, what, I, uh, what I see as the evolution of, of film and uh, of cinema um, will, will first be the, um, the substitution of humans by, by, by machines, by robots and uh, and uh, and um, they will play as be, as as actors. That that will happen. It's already starting. So that uh, it will be terrible because <laughs> yes, because you 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 are already you already have difficulty to uh, to 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 understand what is a fake new, what is what is true, what is fake. And uh, there are already experiences, as you have seen, of some politicians uh, saying something that they have never said because they make. And so the, the, the cinema will appropriate these techniques very quick because it's uh, actors are becoming too expensive also. So they will do it. Uh, that will be the first step. Then to have uh, a machine make a, f a, move, a film, many years, uh, already more than 10 years ago, I went to, to, to a, an exhibition uh, with other artists, and one of the artists had, a, had a, a movie made exactly by a machine. But the movie was made, it was very interesting. The movie was, they just made like 100 scenes all in the same place was an hotel with uh, with uh, actors, and they make like one another. <coughs> and then the, the the machine was uh, putting it together as a film. All the time changing. And the curious was, and it was very curious because it just put the scenes together, and each time was a different film. Because, <laughs> but the most interesting was he said. And the terrible thing is that people came to see this movie and after two hours I need to come to the stage and say, go away because this will never stop. <laughs> <laughs> but people were standing there looking at it. Uh, and the machine was making. I've also, I've also made um, uh, quite different. I have uh, an algorithm that I've created that makes, um, uh, combines, exactly combines, uh, um, uh, 
things taken from the internet and they put together randomly. And it's also very nice. It's never, it never repeats. But these are experimental things. They're not really movies, of course. Well, so, and that so I want to, sorry, if I can. In that case, I feel like when you're mentioning the making of film, the machine is kind of uh, responsible for the editing, while I also was wondering... More editing, yeah. I was wondering that camera itself was considered as the machine that humans okay. were using to make the film. And the problem that was that was in front of film becoming a, an art uh, was its objectivity and the fact that there was no intention. So would do you, do you think the way you were seeing robot art is a way of accepting that robots are subjective and that mm. that's why they could make art. Yeah. But uh, intention is our problem. Mm. Machines don't have intention. And it's good that they don't have intention. So it's much too much our problem. We need to see intentions in everything. Why? <laughs> Not necessary, but we need. Uh, so I want to... Um, we're, we're running late on time and I have to, okay. I can't resist because I, I, I really appreciate that you, you've, you've come and provoked us with these <laughs> so many contradictions and, okay. and, and it challenged us in this way. And I appreciate the, the questions that have come from the audience so much. I, I do think that one thing, and now as I understand better what you're saying, that your, 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 your intention is, is to sort of, is open up our, our sense of, of, of mm -hmm. privilege and, and superiority as humans and to open that up so that well, why should we be the only ones that are given this honor mm -hmm. of, of making art? But I also see a, 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 a danger to this, which is if you, if you say that these all are equivalent and that anything is making art, you also could, be, it could, it could do the reverse thing that exactly what you don't want and worry. Because what it could do is it could now say, then anything goes. Then then nothing there is no there is no distinction as you're sort of shrugging now. That's dangerous, I think, because that says then there is nothing there isn't that's that then then we are all equivalent to everything. Mm -hmm. And there's no distinctions at all. I mean in the Benjamin essay they, he also talks about this is actually the invitation to a e extraordinary liquidation. Exactly. And I don't think that's a good thing because I'm worried about the idea that if you're saying that all humans are equivalent to all anything a machine, then you're also saying that we are that 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 we are no more than machines, and mm -hmm. that is there's actually a danger there. Mm -hmm. Do you see that? Yeah, but uh, I'm sorry, but I'm not the author of that thing. Dushan is when Dushan goes and and puts a, a common object and that makes from that art anything can be art like today anything can be art no no that actually anything. Duchamp Duchamp Marcel Duchamp yes. he very carefully says the opposite he says anyone can make anything and call it art but yeah. what determines it as art is posterity exactly exactly so he doesn't say everything's the same yeah. he says you can try it yeah, you can yeah, call yeah, it but, yeah. it'll, but, but, but but the posterity will determine it exactly so he has a very strong hierarchy yeah, in his exactly, mind exactly exactly but <laughs> Who gives that facility? Also, the system that accepts, the context that accepts that this is art and this is not art. So, Dusha opened this door, which could mean anything can be art. If anything can be art, nothing is art. Okay. But we have a system of integrating what the community accepts as art and what it doesn't. It's a system, it's not very good, but it's the only one that we have right now. Posterity will look at it differently. Differently. Uh, probably they will look at Duchamp and consider it is not art, and today is, uh, I, consider, I think it's art, very good, but it, it doesn't matter uh, for, for this uh, discussion. But I'm not saying, <coughs> I'm not saying that uh, uh, everything is the same. No, on the contrary. On the contrary, what I'm saying, everything is different. It's completely different. So I say, uh, we make art, machines make art. It's different. 
But this is not less, it's more. It's one more possibility. We have one more thing. If we start looking at uh, uh, what we can call art b done by animals, for example, that's more simple than machines, it's not less, it's more. We look at it with the same eyes or similar eyes that we look at paintings that are in museums. Why not? It's not, it's not less, it's more. It's even better for us because we have more things, more diversity, more things to look at, more things to... Because when we look at art, we tend to try to, to understand, to see implications, intentions, and it doesn't matter. And people look at this robot, these things, and they see a lot of things. I'm amazed sometimes. And they say, ah, oh, this is, uh, I don't know what. It's incredible because people need to understand, need to, but uh, to give intentions to things. Robots are very honest. They don't have intentions. But when you go to see the history of art, that's why my, my next exhibition is uh, in two weeks and it's called The Surrealistic Robot. The Robot Surrealist. Why? Because, in fact, as you know, surrealist, the theor theoretical, not, the, not so much the painters, not uh, the painters like Dali, that was more the dreams and so on. But surrealists exactly to try to do a kind of art without any intention. As you know, the automatism psyche was to try to make something without intention. But uh, by trying to do something without intention, they amplify the, the, the intention in the observer. The observers, when they look at the paintings of the robots, they, they, they see a lot of things. They see, depends on the person, but they see also our time, our moment, the moment where machines are so important to us, uh, where machines, like you have said in the beginning, are, are making us afraid of it. Of, of the possibilities, are dangers, are, are uh, dystopia, also a possible dystopia, a possible utopia, but also a possible dystopia. So people see, people understand that um, this is more than just some scribbles. So I don't, I don't have this, uh, the, this idea that try to put the, the human, I try to put the human out of the loop of the not interesting thing like making paintings with this. This is not interesting anymore for 100 years. But people keep on doing it and fantastic. No, I have, not, I have nothing against it, but it's not interesting. Okay, great. On that excellent note, let's, uh, let's, let's uh, thank you so much. Everybody.